Hello and welcome to Gecko Online. In today's lesson, we'll take you on the journey of sustainable business. We've been working with business and manufacturing in China, seeing the change in attitudes towards sustainability. People want to know if business really can prosper by going sustainable, or if this is all just wishful thinking. Everything we've seen has convinced us that business really can lead the way. The ones that really embrace sustainability are showing us how it's done. But to understand where we're headed, we need to look back and see how far we've come, and how far we have yet to go. Before we set off, let's just get one thing out of the way. It's this word sustainable, since we'll be using it a lot. Really what it means is not unsustainable, not the end of the world. So it means we're not using up all the stuff on earth, we're not covering it in waste that never goes away, and we're making life better for people, not worse. That's a good journey for business to be on. After all, we invented business to make our lives better. Our journey starts back in the 1800s, at the start of the Industrial Revolution. Back then we wouldn't call it a journey to sustainability. It looked more like a war between industry and the environment. Coal was burned freely, with no filters, and the air in the industrial cities in Europe and America became increasingly gray. Unconstrained by any environmental laws, industry continued to release more air and water pollution every year for a hundred years. By the middle of the 20th century, the levels of pollution were jaw-dropping. In December of 1952, London was hit by the Great Smog, when the pollution was so heavy that within days it had killed 4,000 people and sickened over 100,000. Meanwhile, the United States experienced similar smog events, as well as uncontrolled water pollution. The Cuyahoga River in Ohio oozed black with pollution, and when the river caught fire in 1969, for the thirteenth time, it finally drew attention to the condition of the rivers. Citizens had had enough, and demanded that environmental laws be passed. Britain and America soon passed their first Clean Air Acts and Clean Water Acts to regulate the worst of the abuses. Industry was forced to pay for pollution damages and install expensive pollution treatment equipment. Companies who failed to comply with the laws were shut down or forced to pay fines, and their profits plummeted. A lot of them started moving their production to factories in China and developing countries where environmental laws were less strictly enforced. It became clear to everyone in business that protecting the environment was a cost, plain and simple. So the battle lines were drawn, with business on one side and environment on the other. Would we always be forced to choose between the two? The laws did help the environment a little, at least in the developed countries, but the story doesn't stop there. There was another movement in the 60s that brought conditions to a head. Cheap production had already gotten ahead of what people even wanted, so they needed a way to increase demand. Advertisers and marketers put their heads together and consumerism was born. More and more cheaper products appeared on the market, designed to last for short times so more could be sold. Production increased, and with so much of the manufacturing already happening in countries with little environmental enforcement, environmental impacts got worse, not better. One multinational company set up a chemical plant in Bhopal, India, ignoring safety regulations and working with oversized tanks of deadly poisonous chemicals next to the homes of a million people. Late one night in 1984, a tank ruptured, releasing the toxic chemicals into the air of the city. Panic broke out as people woke up in clouds of poisonous gases that burned their lungs and killed 20,000 people. It became clear that government regulations alone would never be enough. Businesses had to find their own reasons for pursuing sustainability. One reason was that energy and resources started to get expensive. In 1973, war broke out in the Middle East. Oil-producing nations closed the pipelines, and gas tanks around the world hovered on empty. People waited in line at gas pumps for hours, only to find the pumps empty by the time the line finished. Oil prices shot up to four times the original price and stayed there for a decade. The stock markets crashed, and business ground to a halt. Today, the oil prices are even higher. It was a wake-up call. Some companies realized they could save money by using less energy and materials for their products and services. These companies were starting out on a new stage of the journey by choosing to do more for the environment than the law required. They were taking their first cautious steps towards sustainability. We call them the tiptoers. Saving money wasn't the only reason. Companies also had their reputation to think about. If people believed the company was helping out in their community, making safe and healthy products, and treating their workers fairly, it would improve their reputation and give them more customers. If people felt the company was poisoning the environment, using dangerous chemicals in their products, and abusing workers, they would look bad and lose customers. Since so many companies had already moved their factories overseas, there was nobody to police them, so the corporations were responsible to police themselves. They called this corporate social responsibility. 
So they made a special new department in the company, the Corporate Social Responsibility Department, and gave them the job of making the company socially responsible. The CSR departments did great work, donating money to build schools, contributing to local charities, organizing community events, and tree planting. All good news. The only problem was, it wasn't really helping that much. Sure, the companies were saving a bit of energy here and there, but that was never going to get them off fossil fuels entirely for truly sustainable energy, not to mention dealing with waste, toxics, or labor issues. And the CSR departments couldn't help much, since they were separate from most business operations. So while the CSR departments were off planting trees, the rest of the company was doing business as usual. And they weren't even breaking even on the money they were paying for CSR. When they asked hundreds of tiptoer companies about it, less than a quarter said their sustainability investments were paying off. So far, the sustainability journey wasn't looking so good. If it just meant companies changing their light bulbs and planting a few trees, it wasn't ever going to get us anywhere. And it wasn't even making money, so companies might as well save themselves the trouble. So is our journey towards sustainability over? Not quite. You see, all those problems that made us care about sustainability in the first place haven't gone away. In fact, they're getting worse, and more and more people are starting to pay attention. First, the governments are still pushing companies, and the regulations keep getting stricter, even for companies that moved all their factories overseas. When European regulations required electronics companies to recycle their products when people finish with them, that affected every company that wants to sell in the EU, even if they're from China or America. Second, the investors are getting involved. If a company is about to get fined by the government for pollution or have its reputation ruined because of an environmental scandal, the investors could lose a lot of money, so they want to know the risks. The Carbon Disclosure Project pushes companies to disclose their climate change risks, and it has a lot of muscle behind it. It represents investors with $71 trillion under management. That's more money than the entire world's GDP in 2010. Third, employees want to work for companies they can believe in. The best job candidates are now looking very carefully at companies' sustainability track records. After all, if you got good enough grades in school to choose the company you worked for, which one would you choose? And most importantly, consumers care more than ever about buying from companies that do the right thing. Many of them care not only about product quality and personal health effects, but about the impact of the company on the environment and society. Marketers have come up with a name for this segment. They call it LOHAS, Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability, and it has become a major influence on how companies market their products. In this new landscape, some companies see sustainability as essential for being competitive. They pursue it not only for cost savings and improving their reputation, but they're going further, embracing sustainability as part of their core business strategy. Because they're consistently walking the walk and not just talking about it, we call them the marchers. Instead of just making sustainability the job of the CSR department, they get the whole company involved, from the CEO all the way down. Whenever they make a business decision, the impacts of that decision on the environment and community are included. The marchers know that sustainability can help them attract the best employees and challenge those employees to come up with new and better ways of doing things. And this innovation can win the company new customers and expand market share. Sometimes these benefits can be hard to predict until you just go ahead and do them. But marchers are confident enough to act without all the answers and then measure the results as they go. One famous example of this is Interface, the world's biggest carpet tile manufacturer. In the mid-90s, the founder, Ray Anderson, had customers asking what Interface was doing for the environment. He found he didn't have much to say. But this simple question set off a chain reaction that convinced Ray that sustainability was the right thing to do. Interface started investing in efficiency, cutting their waste and saving energy. But Ray realized it would take a lot more than that. Ray got everyone in the company involved. Together, they defined their vision of sustainability. The company's goal was that one day they would take nothing from the earth that the earth could not naturally and rapidly renew and do no harm to the biosphere. Knowing it would be a long journey, they called it Climbing Mount Sustainability and aimed to reach the top by 2020. Without hard data to prove that investments in sustainability would ever pay off, Interface's investors didn't jump at the opportunity, but Interface was willing to take a leap of faith. To eliminate their greenhouse gas emissions at the first Interface factory, they looked at the city's landfill which was releasing tons of methane, a greenhouse gas 20 times stronger than CO2. It also happened to be an excellent fuel. If they could find a way to harvest that methane, they would eliminate all of their factory's emissions and save money on their energy costs. They couldn't prove for sure that it would pay off, but their research convinced them that it was likely enough to go ahead. Sure enough, they not only got enough methane to fuel their plant, 
but enough to sell to other factories, easily paying off their investment. By eliminating the city's main source of methane emissions, their factory became carbon neutral. As if that weren't enough, they were also able to sell carbon neutral carpets, which became a surprise hit with customers. With this momentum behind them, they were ready to attempt something that had never been done before, taking the old carpet piling up in landfills and recovering the materials to turn it back into new carpet, closing the loop. They had to invent all the technologies to do it, but today 40% of Interface's carpet is made out of old carpet or biomaterials. Their waste and greenhouse gas emissions are a quarter of what they were when they started their journey. This goes for all their plants, including the new one in China. Cost savings alone are not enough to explain the full value that Interface has achieved through sustainability. As Ray puts it, the goodwill in the marketplace has been astonishing. As Interface has continued its 17-year climb up Mount Sustainability, the company's profits have tripled. The evidence is showing that companies who integrate sustainability into their core strategy get a lot more from their investments than companies that only tiptoe in that direction. Two-thirds of the marchers say they are profiting from their investments in sustainability. Even more of them report they are beating the competition, so we see that it is possible to prosper through sustainability. And not only that, it's becoming necessary just to be competitive in business. Sustainability is not a trend. It's always been about the survival of people on this planet, and now it's becoming necessary for the survival of business too. All of this has happened because companies are made of people, employees, citizens and consumers. And as people, we want to believe that tomorrow will be better than today. So where will the journey of sustainable business take us? The marchers are showing us the way. From where we are today, we can see there's only one direction to go. We hope that you too can help lead the way.